Well, good evening. It's a delight to be with you. Um, my mind is all full of all the shiny things that we've been seeing in all these sessions. Hopefully, I will focus on the task. Um, <laughs> curiosity landed me in the middle of Alaska, uh, full winter, and pulling a very heavy sled with everything I needed to survive. Uh, that was uh, about day five in this picture, uh, 200 miles into the Iditarod Trail. It was say, February 23rd of this year. The sun was setting, temperature was rapidly dropping bef uh, below 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, I was giddy. I was giddy because I had just uh, passed the top of the Alaska Range and I got to ride my sled at full speed in the dark <laughs> through, the twisty, um, through the twisty trails. And it was the first time that I didn't have to pull anymore. <laughs> It was just a wonderful, wonderful moment. Um, I felt full of energy. Um, I felt fantastic and I uh, felt as if my sled was really light, really light. And a little doubt started creeping into my mind. I turned around, there was no sled. <laughs> I had lost my sled. <laughs> At that moment, I only had one curiosity. Where is my sled? <laughs> Pressing, intense, urgent. I backtracked uh, and I found it. It was lonely, forlorn, my sled waiting for me. Fortunately, only about a quarter of a mile um, away. <laughs> so the question is, what was I doing there <laughs> in a situation that doesn't look all that desirable or comfortable? A few years ago, I was a 5K and 10K runner who used to think that a half marathon was bad for you. I heard about people that run 100 miles in the mountains and that seemed impossible to me. And I asked myself, how do they do it? Could I do it? And more importantly, given that I'm not into heroics or into sufferfests, could I do it and enjoy it? And that was the key part of my curiosity. Could I learn enough about training, about nutrition, uh, about navigation, about weather, uh, about how my body responds to that kind of stress that I could actually run it and enjoy it? And so, I started learning, trained, and ran my first 50, and then worked with a great ultra-running coach, Cindy Stonesmith, here in Colorado, and ran my first 100, and then had a few more. <laughs> At that point, I knew how to do ultra-running. I had the recipe. I wanted more. I wanted better uncertainty, more discovery. I wanted to get closer to the edge, where there's little knowledge, no common wisdom, great insights to have, and where the self-imposed boundaries become irrelevant because the challenges at hand need to be responded to. And since I, I really have uh, an attraction for the Arctic, I looked north to Alaska. So my first winter race in Alaska was the Susidna 100. I was so scared while I was fumbling to make my final choices for equipment that I missed the race start, which allowed me to take a picture of it. <laughs> The need to know um, helped me overcome the fear and anxiety. It pulled me into the promise of the wonder and the discoveries that could be ahead. And fortunately, it did so, since this is probably one of the most, most enjoyable and beautiful um, hundreds um, that I've ever run. And so I did deliver on that um, initial ambition about being able to run long distances and enjoy myself. <coughs> and there were lots of side benefits. When you start pulling threads from your initial curiosity and you follow them, entire new worlds show up that you can play with and you can have fun with. For instance, you want to train with your sled, but there's no snow right now. No problem. Just take a tire or two. <laughs> and so those are disciplines that I would have never thought I would get to practice. So I actually didn't know it existed. <laughs> it's something that um, needed to be discovered on my side. It's one thing to run for 30 hours from 8 station to 8 station in 100. Um, it's a very different thing to run for 30 days on a lightly supported basis. You need a lot more food and you have to think a, a lot about it. As you dig into the subject, you reach the limits of what's available, uh, commercially available, generally available. And um, I had the pleasure, if, you've, if you ski, you know that it can be very aggravating to have your goggles fog. Polar explorer Eric Larson, who uh, lives with us in Colorado, um, 
taught me this. He taught me to make um, goggle beaks. With a goggle beak, you redirect your breath down, preventing the fog from showing up on the goggles. And of course, it also keeps your face warm. So you get to play with equipment and you get to develop and build your own equipment as you get into more and more detail and bigger and bigger challenges. No, this is not me in the Alaska range being stalked by a wolf. <laughs> it's actually Beat, Beat Jaeger Lerner, also lives in Colorado. He's finished the Iditarod Trail Invitational 1,000 miler three times. And the wolf is my border collie scout. <laughs> and we're training in the mountains of Colorado. And uh, the point is, as you get into this topic, you find your tribe. You find the people that have the same curiosity. You get with them, and you learn together. And you develop a new world of knowledge and experience that is really worthy, which is one of the keys of the reasons I got into this. I didn't want a book answer, or I didn't want to spectate how somebody runs 100 miles or more. I wanted the tangible, the experiential, the visceral understanding of what that meant. And so I did my Susitna 100, and then I went on to other winter races, um, last year culminating into the Yukon Arctic 300 miler. And uh, at that point, um, I wanted more. There was more to be learned. I wanted to go beyond um, what was a normal race. There are two races in Alaska that are 1,000-ish miles long. The uh, Edita Sport Extreme and the uh, Edita Road Trail Invitational. Um, they're both in the winter, in February. They're lightly supported. And uh, they go from Anchorage to Nome. I signed up this year for the Edita Sport Extreme. Uh, you can uh, run it, you can bike it, you can ski it. Uh, you can see me third from the right, and this time it doesn't actually look like I'm scared. <laughs> so, I, I learned to hide it at least. <laughs> um, the course follows the Editora Trail, uh, biggest part of it. Uh, it goes through frozen rivers, frozen swamps, frozen lakes, frozen mountains, frozen tundra, frozen sea ice. Very diverse terrain, even if it's all frozen. <laughs> but behind every question, uh, there's beauty waiting, even if it's frozen. And frozen can be beautiful and worth going for. And so up here you see Mount Susidna as I run along the Susidna River, the frozen Susidna River. Um, here you see the um, Alaska Range. That's where I lost my sled. And you can see one of the iconic tripods that marks the Ditera Trail. You can actually see two. Um, Beat, uh, the man who finished three times that race, actually has one of these tripods on his driveway here in Colorado. Um, or the Yukon River. At some point during the race, you make it all the way to the Yukon. Frozen, jumbled ice. That ice might have been perfectly smooth a week before. The conditions change constantly. And, uh, you're regaled with something that is extremely dynamic and which involves the three states of water. And also, you notice in this picture, and it's true, truer as you go north, the play between light and clouds uh, gets more and more mesmerizing as you go up. Uh, for instance, during this race, uh, in which I was about 14 or 15 days, I got aurora borealis every two days, every two nights, I should say. But Questions, some of the questions you ask yourself can also create challenges for you, big challenges. There might be a dozen ways of dying out there, a dozen ways of uh, compromising your limbs. And of course, uh, part of the curiosity is how do you learn all of the practices, processes, tools that would allow you for that not to happen? To acquire the mastery that will open the door for you to be able to answer that question and to satisfy that curiosity. In this particular case, we're talking about things like open water. And so as you're running on a frozen river, you do not want to fall in the open water and be taken away by the current under the ice, because that's a bad outcome. Um, <coughs> and it's something that you want to learn um, to assess in terms of what's the quality of the ice you're in. Similarly, there might be weak snow or ice bridges, and you have to assess those and prepare yourself. You might run into overflow. That's excess water that pierces through the ice, creates a liquid layer that is often hidden by another layer of snow. 
And so for all those situations, like the one that you can see behind me, um, what I did is always let my sled go first and um, let, let, let it tell me what the situation was. <coughs> it's one of the simplest um, techniques they can use, even if it's, it's, uh, my sled was um, half as heavy as I was. But the main complication, the main challenge in a race like that, which is so long and lasts so uh, unsufferably long, um, is variation. This is a picture of Alaskan endurance phenom David Johnston. He's won the shorter 350-mile Editorot Trade Invitational six years in a row. His shortest time is 98 hours. His longest time is 210 hours, a difference of four days. And what you see in the picture is a part of one of his races where there were 50 miles where there was no snow. So he was pulling the sled uh, on whatever terrain uh, was available at that moment. And variation for me uh, personally is a very attractive feature. The ability to respond to a very broad array of situations, to be able to have the tool, the ability to respond to the challenge as it changes, as opposed to a hyper-specialization where you get rid of all variation. Sort of an aesthetic consideration of why I have this curiosity for things like that. All of these complications ex might explain why only 15 runners have actually finished this thousand mile um, course. Um, and chief among them, Tim Hewitt, in this picture, has actually done it 10 times. His 10th completion um, has happened at the age of 62, uh, which gives me seven years to try to uh, do the job. <laughs> Along with the known beauty that you can expect, along with the known challenges that you can expect and prepare for, there's the reward and the treasure of unexpected wonder. The things that you didn't know you were, were going to happen, and many of them are wonderful discoveries. I didn't know as I got into the trail that I would go through a whole series of small towns and settlements that uh, were magical because they were so different from anything that I knew. For instance, the town of Nikolai, population 50. In 1963, they built their own runway so that they could be reached by the rest of the world. And they actually have three flights a week. With those three flights a week, they supplement their hunting and gathering with Amazon Prime two-day delivery. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how they get their frozen pizza, TP, diapers, and um, kibble for the doggies. A longtime resident who was waiting for his delivery invited me to dinner while I was there at the airport, and I got to enjoy a wonderful moose stew. His wife had hunted the moose and had cooked the stew. And I am incredibly grateful for all the randoms, uh, random acts of kindness that I experienced along the trail. From that, from um, the invitation to sleep in the library of the school at Nikolai, to the woman who was uh, very concerned about me and the bears and gave me a charm to, to keep them away, uh, to the couple that gave me a little bottle of schnapps in case of emergency. <laughs> All of those encounters, unexpected and new relationships, turn the experience into something magical because it's beyond your control. And it's the part that makes it truly um, special. There's another very important part that doesn't happen in relationship with others, that doesn't happen in relationship with a landscape, and it's internal. They say that ultra running is mental more than physical, and when you're going from a hundred to a thousand, that truly um, must probably be true. <laughs> and so um, you can see me here at mile 450. This is 150 miles further than I had ever run. I look a little tired. And um, I am in need of using all of the mental tools that I can use. Uh, four mental tools that worked um, reasonably well for me uh, are, first, uh, the way uh, we listen to pain. We tend to interpret pain as a message to stop. Pain turns out to be a much more subtle and nuanced message. And if you learn to listen to it, all kinds of interesting things can happen. You can increase the space of action that you have. Um, sometimes pain is just noise, and you just ignore it. Sometimes pain um, suggests a small adjustment, uh, maybe a change in gait, and you do that. Sometimes pain just moves around, and that's fine, as long as it moves, you're okay. 
Sometimes you just mumble, these two shall pass. And it actually does after a while. Only once in dozens of races did I have to, to consider the message as an order to stop. And believe me, there's a lot of pain involved in these things. <laughs> um, when you are in a thousand mile race, if you ask yourself, you think about the end of the race at mile 10, mile 100, mile 900, that's not going to be productive. Uh, it might create uh, unsurmountable internal obstacles. Instead, I like to think of the race as infinite. There is no end. I will race forever. If I'm on a very steep climb, I'll do the same thing. The climb is not going to end. It's infinite. There's no point worrying about it. Anticipation is gone. And at that moment, I am free from the future. I am not trying to get to something anymore. And um, on another front, it happens that I make mistakes in planning, and I discover that during the race. So it might be a wrong choice of equipment, maybe a logistical error. I discovered at mile 400 that I wouldn't have coffee for 200 miles, and I'm a coffee addict. <laughs> so I could have spent a long time just kicking a ghost of the past. You know, you damn Jorge T minus one, why did you do this to me, Jorge time T? Um, but <laughs> I find it more useful to tell myself, it's my job now. I get to drive. I have the relay baton. I'm on the driver's seat of this jalopy, even if it doesn't have coffee cup holders. <laughs> and that frees me from the past. And now that I'm free from the past and from the future, I can be entirely in the moment, in the present. And in this particular situation, the one thing that is most productive for me to live in that moment, in the present, is incessant forward motion. As long as I am moving, things are going well. I happen to like and enjoy proprioception, the movement of muscles, tendons, and joints at work. And so I get an immediate reward living in the present. With incessant forward motion, that immediate reward builds into a desirable final result. In this particular race, if you wanted to be in the game, you had to cover at least 40 or 50 miles a day. This year, the snow was extremely deep in Alaska, and the temperatures dipped to um, fairly annoying levels. <laughs> <laughs> and so most of I had to move at least 20 hours every 24. And this being February, most of that movement happened in the dark. So my only sensory stimulation was a circle of light from my headlamp. So the only place I could go to was inside. And so I had a multi-day uh, psychoanalysis program for free, <laughs> <laughs> where I got to examine most of my past actions and discover the little games, the pettiness, the ego-saving strategies, uh, which all looked pretty silly from the depths of Alaska. I also got to sort, rank, and select um, goal, life goals. And so that was a very interesting, unexpected uh, process that I had to contend with. It was very hard. It was extremely hard. The conditions were unusually harsh. I had never done a thousand. And so I had to resort to more mental tools that I had not had to use before. Among them, chocolate cookies. <laughs> not any, just any kind of chocolate cookies. These are digestives, British chocolate cookies. And so I really had to dig into very basic uh, approaches. And the fact is that I did not finish the 1,000. By mile 400, there were only two runners left. At mile 600, we decided to stop. I felt like I had burned all my video game lives. <laughs> there was nothing left in there. And so um, I'm signed up for next year to complete the trip, to answer the questions that have not been answered yet from a curiosity perspective, such as, what does it feel like to run on, on a frozen ocean, on the Bering Strait, which you get to if you go far enough? I don't know that yet, and it pulls me, it calls to me. Um, in the meantime, I, this, this asking myself, what is it like to run 100 miles and enjoy it, provided me with rewards and experiences that I could have never imagined. It went way out of control. 
but um, it, it's basically opened up an entire world for me. At this point, I have the skill to be able to satisfy my curiosity just about anywhere in the Arctic, whether it's Greenland or Siberia or the Arctic Ocean or the boreal forest around the Arctic. And I can't wait to go there. I let curiosity um, guide my life. It took me to this place. Um, it's helped me design a unique life and get to unique insights. And I invite you to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>